sitting in the in the hard stuff is really really uncomfortable but also really really necessary like i think that one of the hardest but most important things that we can do is like is sit with that whether it's trauma or grief or just a stupid bad day like just sitting with that dealing with it kind of processing things and just letting ourselves feel those emotions All right, what's up everybody? Welcome to the show. This is the What You Don't Hear podcast. It's a life podcast, it's a story podcast, it's an open journal dive into people's lives as I sit and I uncover the real story behind my guest's journey, finding out what makes them who they are, digging into the parts of their story that we otherwise wouldn't get to hear. I am your host, my name is Ross Tyson. I'm a creative of many kinds, a maker of many things. As you uh, probably guessed, one of those things is indeed podcasting, as I bring you, well, honestly, a couple different shows at this point, but I bring you this one right here every other Monday for the full-length episodes and then sporadically on many Fridays for those shorter topic-based 15-minute Fridays. Now, in this episode, I sit down with my wonderful guest, Krista, who is a CrossFit trainer at my gym, CrossFit Gehanna. And uh, we, of course, dig into her story of how she got into the fitness world, um, how she went from member to coaching, and honestly, a lot of just like real feel good advice. Um, Because we talk a lot about how Krista never really had her own like thing in life. Um, She became a mom early in life, and that, of course, was uh, her main focus. But then She, uh, in turn, pushed many of her wants and needs for self-love pretty far down. Um, But we talked about how she eventually has found those things, um, is of course working on that balance and dealing with the many ups and downs that she's experienced. And honestly, we just talk a lot about that self-love part, um, a lot of it in this episode. Um, It makes for a really good conversation. And like I said, I I think um, it sort of just leaves you feeling good. Um, At least that's how I felt after the conversation and even, even when I was going back and editing this episode. I just felt good listening back to it. Um, so, you know, just, uh, I don't know, feeling hopeful that uh, we can all figure out those tough things that we're dealing with. And uh, hopefully it gives you that same feeling when you listen to it as well here in just a moment, because we will jump into that conversation in a second. But you know how it goes down now at this point. I've got some wonderful supporters helping me keep the mics on around here. And while they support me, I of course support them. And the first one that I want to tell you about is our newest sponsor, our friends over at Midwest Photo. Now, Midwest Photo is a video, audio, and of course, photo store located right here in Columbus. Now, Midwest is a place that, uh, as someone who has dabbled in photography over the years, it's a place that I've been to many, many times for many different reasons. And I'm here to tell you that it's a real rad place filled with real rad people. And I'm genuinely, honestly, very excited that they have decided to hop on here and support the show as a sponsor. So what is all inside the walls of Midwest Photo? Well, there's plenty of reasons that I've went through over the years, whether it's to purchase some camera gear, ranging from everything from cameras themselves to lighting, backdrops, tripods. Um, In fact, one of the tripods that I use to film this show on came from Midwest. Um, But the list goes on all the way down to small things like SD cards. They have it all. Now, of course, if you're not looking to purchase, the good news is they offer gear rental as well. It's in a list of many, many services that their uh, wonderful and intelligent staff and honestly, very, very helpful staff are ready to help you with the moment you walk in. Uh, for real, whenever I went in there for something, there was always someone ready to answer questions and, uh, and just talk to you about any and all the things that you could need in the world of video or photo. Um, but along with rentals, they also offer a full in-house printing service, film development and scanning, used gear, buying and selling, and even classes so you can further your knowledge about the art and craft of photography. Now, the cool thing is when you shop with them, you're not just supporting local and shopping small, but you're also supporting folks who love photography and work to support the local photo community right here in Columbus. So go check them out. If you do, tell them I sent you. Tell them that Ross, from what you don't hear, sent you their way. So if you want to find out more information on everything they're about, you can follow them online at mpex underscore photo underscore video, or simply jump to mpex.com. That's mpe dot com. And I cannot thank them enough for sponsoring this episode. 
We are also supported by our friends over at Promo West Productions because talking about Columbus's music scene is one thing, but we all know that experiencing it live is entirely another. So if you feel like going to a show, if you want to if you want to know what concerts are going down here in Columbus, check out maybe one of the following upcoming concerts that are going down at Newport Music Hall brought to you by Promo West. On March 4th, it's Columbus Against the World featuring Adam Paddock, Cousin Simple, and Spirit of the Bear. Again, that's Saturday, March 4th. They've got City Morgue on April 2nd, Queen Search on April 4th, and Judah and the Lion are coming to town on April 5th. So if you want to grab tickets, you can jump to AXS.com. Or, as always, for more information on these shows or any other upcoming concerts, you can find all the info that you need over at promowestlive.com. So, yes, another big thank you to our sponsors. Um, it's never going to not be cool to me that I get to talk about sponsorships and supporters for this show. That is so insanely cool. We're three years in and we're not slowing down. This yellow train keeps rolling and the story-filled journey continues right now as I sit down and I get to know Krista Jansko right here in episode 76 of What You Don't Hear. Through the story. Like, this is who? awful. Who is this girl? Yeah, why did I ask you to the show? <laughs> I honestly don't know. Like, I mean, I don't feel like I'm very interesting, but... <laughs> <laughs> this will be a good time to find out. I guess so. We're either going to spend an hour or two talking about uninteresting things. Maybe, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I think everybody's, everybody's story is just more interesting than what we probably think they are. Okay. <laughs> and I, think, I always think there's value in, I don't know, people telling those stories. Because I think everybody sees like, oh, this is what I do day to day or this is, this is my life and I just sort of do this stuff. And it's like, well, to somebody else that might sound interesting, mm -hmm. even if it's not this like magical, crazy thing. You know yeah. what I mean? So on that note, you're the new CEO of Apple. <laughs> uh, so Krista, tell me what it was like to take over Apple. I mean, Steve Jobs, I mean, he just wasn't, he wasn't hitting it. That's like, true. He has he, been dead for a few years. Yeah. Can't he really just, he wasn't doing it anymore. So somebody had to step up. And they called you. They did. They said, Hey, Krista. They what did. Do you, what do you think about <laughs> taking a back seat? I mean, my, my tech background just speaks for itself. Exactly. That's true. I don't even mm. know if we need to record that much. I think we, I could just post your resume. You could just post that and then social. just CEO of Apple. Exa and then people would be like, oh, we, we get it. We got it. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. We, we totally see it. <laughs> they would be like, say no more. <laughs> we don't need her on the podcast. <laughs> you told us enough of what she does. <laughs> well, now that we've set the bar very high... Are we recording right now? We're recording. Oh. We've been recording this whole time. Oh, fantastic. And I'll probably... I love that you just segued us into that I'll so quickly. i leave most of it in, <laughs> to be honest, especially the announcement of you being uh, in control of Apple. I love it. I, um, I mean, I, I am an ad Apple advocate for through sure. and through. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you have, have an Android, I don't... Don't even talk to him. Don't. I can't talk to you. Exactly. I mean, that's I strange. still love you, but I'm probably not going to text you back. Well, yeah. That's <laughs> no, one, no one wants a green bubble. No, that's absolutely not. Kind of disgusting. Red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Green bubble, red flag. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> it's so funny. You hear that so much. It cracks oh, me up. But it's, it's, I've, it's I've, accurate, though. I feel like I it mean, is. I mean, like, there's some cool people I know with green text bubbles. Few and far between. But do we talk that often? We don't. No. We don't. But I am happy to see them when I see them in real life. Yeah. If I That's can't, if I can't like, if I can't heart or like your actual text without it then popping back and telling me that I liked your text. That's true. I, I can't get on board yeah. with that. I don't need a text back <laughs> telling me the thing that I just exactly. did. Just show me the little emoji. Show me the emoji and we're, and we're going to have or a good day. Or if they can't be in a group text either. Oh. Mm. That's, you know, that's a whole other thing. Like now you're bringing everybody down. Not yet. With now you're ruining the, the whole talking. group. I can see why they hired you. <laughs> I understand. Right? I'm just trying to convert everybody. This is, I mean, truthfully, I support it. Perfect. I'm down. This uh, episode <laughs> of the podcast sponsored by Apple. <laughs> uh, sponsored completely by Apple. I do need a new iPhone, so Apple, if you're listening. If you're listening, she did uh, joke about Steve Jobs being dead. Uh, but <laughs> send her three things. It's I fun. thought you said that. <laughs> I did. I really did. I yeah, did say that. You and did. I blamed it on you. But that's okay. It's, you know, that's what happens. I I'm the fall guy. I'll when take I'm, it. When I'm in charge around here, <laughs> This is my show. This is, and this is a beautiful space. You've well, done you. so well for yourself. This I is really fantastic. It. It's, uh, it's funny doing something that I'm technically kind of in charge of 
you in a way of like, oh, I'm guiding you through this. Yeah. When normally it would be in the gym, the other you way, would be guiding me I would be telling things. you to squat lower. Exactly. Or get your heels down. Exactly. Yeah. And so now I'm like, and this is how we podcast. This is yes. what we're going to do. <laughs> we'll speak into a mic. It's a, it's a, it's a, fun, uh, it's a fun reversal of rules. It is. Honestly. It's interesting. I and like it, it. In a way, it does, it does feel weird because I feel like, honestly, when I had Brian on, I felt the same way where I was like, oh man, I'm in... I'm in the lead now. Like I'm yeah. leading this thing that they're kind of unfamiliar with. Yeah, I bet that was kind of really awkward for it, you. It was because you were fairly new then, kind of new at, at that the time. Point in time yeah, that was only. I feel like that was a handful of months into me being at the gym. Yeah. Um, because I really can't meet nearly anyone that I think is interesting without immediately being like, "Do you want to be on this podcast?" <laughs> like, um, well, I'm flattered that you had half a conversation with me and <laughs> well the thing is honestly what did it i mean i think the day that i asked you was the day we did the video interviews mm-hmm. for crossfit Gehanna. Mm-hmm. um and i was just like okay i can tell like you put thought into your answers and you like cared about the answers you were giving and i feel like we had even had we talked about it before or had i talked to brian about it before i feel like it came up before okay where maybe brian had mentioned like yeah if you ever want a future guest like krista i think would be a good one like she has like a really good story and i'm like all right noted and then i think maybe we had been in classes together been in classes together yeah and then i think we wound up talking that day after we did the interviews for like an hour afterwards and you're like okay like stop hold all this like we're gonna have you on the show yeah 100 (laughs) percent. and i was like I feel like I just told you everything, but okay, let's do it again. <laughs> well, the good thing is, uh, I have forgotten nearly everything we Perfect. talked about that day. Very so, forget- I'm very forgettable. <laughs> yeah. So you're pretty forgettable, so I brought you back on the show. Awesome. So try and impress me again. Perfect. <laughs> so, and how, yeah, how many subscribers and listeners you there we'll are? We'll find out. We'll find out. We'll find out. Hopefully they're not going they're down. They're going to either, year. they're probably going to forget me, but it's fine. I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. Like I said at the start of this, I think you're more interesting than what you maybe think you are. Because again, literally, that was like, when I was hearing your answers for those video questions, I was like, damn, these are like amazing. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, let's get through this. It was yeah. like, this is why I care about these things that mm-hmm. I do. Or this is why I care about the community or like, whatever it is. Yeah. And between that and just like hearing or seeing bits and pieces of your story, the little bit that I know as an outsider, Mm -hmm. I do think that makes for like, okay, like, yes, an interesting story for a podcast. Like, even if we weren't recording this right now, there's still like, if I didn't have a show that I could bring people on, I still probably would have asked you at some point, like, hey, can we go get coffee one day or something and just sit and like, just talk? Yeah, for sure. Honestly, I just love doing that with people in general. Um, having a podcast is an easier excuse to be like, hey, let's make something out <laughs> of it. Let's make something, have a conversation. Um, but just like as an outsider, like I've, I've heard and seen bits and pieces of who you are and mm-hmm. your story and all the things you do. Even we were talking a little bit about like what your daily schedule is like right now and all that sort of stuff yeah. before we hopped on here. And so it's a lot of those things that I'm like, okay, that's stuff I want to know more about. All right. And so <laughs> I honestly want to start with like what – like you're relatively new at CrossFit Gahanna, right? I've been at CrossFit Gahanna. Um, it'll be two years in February, okay, so, so not not like, super new. Not super new. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. I, I started there though um, in February of last year, but I really didn't start coaching to the amount that I am now um, for probably maybe like four or five months. Like I kind of like took my time a little bit, like testing the waters. I had some things going on in my life. And the, my, the gym that I was at before actually wound up closing rather unexpectedly. Um, so there was kind of some trauma involved with that. Like I felt like that community was just kind of ripped away and I was kind of mourning the loss of that and then trying to like get in with another, it was all very just traumatic at the time in a sense. So took me a little bit of time to really kind of get completely in the water and start swimming around. <laughs> right. Well, I will say, and I feel like I told you this maybe even after classes, I do think you're an incredible coach. Thank I th- you. I think you are very good at being a coach. And like, I feel like you, you make the classes, which I believe they should be, you make them comfortable. You Thank make you. them, it's very like, yes, you're focused on like, hey, are we doing this right? Are we doing this properly? But it is also like, hey, I'm not going to tell you in a way that's weird or you can ask me Mm -hmm. for certain things. Like, I feel like that was one of the very first things 
that I noticed when I was being coached by you is I was like, I already feel like I can ask her like anything about what we're doing. Yeah. And I, I want people to feel that like when I came into CrossFit, it's been almost 11 years now. I had zero athletic background. I knew absolutely nothing about anything. And I had coaches that were like that, that were just very approachable, um, very down to earth. You could just feel like you could have a conversation with them. And that's how I always wanted to be. I just wanted to, I wanted to make class fun. I wanted to make it the best hour of your day, like no matter what. And, and yes, we're going we're gonna to learn and I'm going to push you and we're going to do the moves right and we're going to get everything. We're going to do all the work that we have to do, but I want to have fun doing it. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't have athletic background. No. So there's not like some like secret backstory of like, no. I used to run track and lift and do all I these did, things. I, I played, um, I was like that kid that did a little bit of everything for like a short amount of time. Okay. Like, so I played basketball maybe in like seventh grade for like one year. I played volleyball in high school, I think my junior year. But beyond that, like I played a little bit of like rec league volleyball in my 20s, like sand volleyball, pickup games kind of stuff. But no, I didn't know. I didn't know how to do an air squat when I started CrossFit. Um, it, yeah, starting CrossFit for me was, it was a challenge in so many ways, like mentally, physically, all of it. So how do you make the jump from like not really being involved in like, it's not, again, you're not walking from like, oh, I'm doing this sport. Now I need something to keep, keep my athleticism up or whatever. So oh, I'm going to go to CrossFit or whatever. Like what made you even go into CrossFit? Yeah. So maybe this is a good story. I don't know. Um, so when I was, again, doing CrossFit for about 11 years, um, in 2009, I was working at Ohio State Hospital and I was just a tech. I was in nursing school at the time and I had an injury. I was helping a patient and um, basically like patient fell on me. I was walking into the restroom, fell on me, had a pretty serious back injury that put me out of work for about a year and a half. I was in PT. I had back surgery, injections, like all different kinds of things that you could possibly have. Um, yeah, so PT for a long time. I really was in pain like constantly and I my pain management doctor at the time so also another side of this story is I was about 115 pounds heavier than I am now really yes okay yeah so basically my doctor said and I it was obviously like a, a very hard pill to swallow at the time but I'm so thankful for it now he said to me he was like Krista he's like if you don't lose some of this weight, he's like, you're probably going to be in pain for the rest of your life. He's like, it's just, that's just the fact of the matter. The weight, your back, your spine, the compression, like all of this stuff is connected. Like it's, you're probably going to be in pain for the rest of your life. Wow. So I went home and I really didn't know what to do with that information. Cause you know, I was, my kids were young. I, I didn't really, ha I was a single mom. I didn't really think I had the time or the energy to put into myself or any type of fitness. Um, but I started like slowly. I started just kind of doing like some walking, some light jogging, started on Weight Watchers just to kind of try to start eating a little bit better. Um, and then I had a friend that had just started doing CrossFit and you probably know how that goes. Like she just can't stop talking about it at the, you know, that's all our conversations were. And I'm like, God, can you please stop talking about CrossFit? Like this is annoying. And she's like, no, like just come try a class. Like I promise you'll love it. And I'm like, I can't do any of this stuff. Like I just had back surgery a year ago. I just had injections six months ago. Like I'm still in so much pain. Like there's no way I can do any of this stuff. And she was like, just come to a class, just come with me, watch the class, talk to the coaches, the owners, whatever. Um, and so I did, it was probably a few weeks after that conversation that I finally like worked up the nerve to go, but I went and I just immediately like fell in love with it. Like I wasn't even doing anything. I was sitting in the corner, just watching the class and how engaged the athletes were with each other, how, you know, focused the coach was, how just everything about the atmosphere. Like I just fell in love with immediately. And I talked to the owner that night 
and signed up for like their foundations class like that night. And the, my first class was the very next day. That's wild. <laughs> it, isn't it weird? Like the whole like disconnect of like CrossFit and I don't know. I, and obviously there's, you know, some, there is some silliness that comes with like the word CrossFit. Oh but, yeah. You know, there, there's people that give it a bad name. For like, sure. It's like you drink the Kool-Aid. It's like, oh, like you're one of those. It's yeah. like, yeah, I am. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. And it's like not too bad. Right? Yeah. And like, cause that's any of the conversations I have now, like anybody who knows that like I've, you know, been going to the, the CrossFit gym for you know over a year now, everyone's like, oh my God, I don't know how you do. Like, <laughs> that's insane. You must be superhuman now. And I'm like, well, one, that's cool. Uh, yeah. How do you think that? But also like, I don't know, like maybe I'm wrong, but like I, like are there really tough and crazy workouts? Sure. Mm-hmm. But also like the disconnect is like when you see somebody like, I don't know, in like a hype video on Instagram or on like ESPN or something, and they're doing cross, like those are like the one percenters that oh, are like. Oh, for sure. So it's like, I feel like everybody gets that in their head of like, oh, cross. Like, oh my God, insane. I can't climb a wall. Like I can't do this. It's like. You want me to walk like a hundred yards on my hands? It's like, like I can't no, do that. Like, no, dude. Like no one's wanting you to. Like, no. no like and I just, and nine times out of ten, like your coach probably can't even do that stuff. Like right. it's yeah. A, yeah it's, there's it's not. And that's that's always been the beauty of I think what what drew me to CrossFit initially, and I think what I still love most about it is that it is so completely scalable for everyone at every level of their fitness, like no matter what. Yeah, that was the coolest thing. Like when I first started, you know, it was like I could do things, but not really. Like, and for sure the moves, I'd say the moves are probably the hardest part, mm-hmm. realistically. Mm-hmm. It's just like, okay, wait, you want me, I shrug my shoulders, but then I also lift in like, a, but I don't lift. I have but to I shrug and pull with my elbows and then I have to get it up to my shoulders and then I have to put it overhead. Like how to like Ex- all these steps. <laughs> exactly. Like the mechanics of it mm-hmm. can be difficult for sure. Um, but like being able to just like be walked through it, honestly, mm-hmm. like that, that I think is like the biggest thing. It's like, it's not any, anytime I'm ever, you know, cause I'm doing this, I'm that person now who's like telling friends, not like, Oh my God, it'll change your life. You got to cook. But I'm yeah. like, Hey, like you tell me you want to go to the gym or you actively kind of go to the gym, but you want something more like come with me sometime yeah. and just try it out. They're always like, oh, that cro- I can't do CrossFit. And yeah. I'm like, dude, like we're probably like, on the day that we are recording this right now, we did sit ups and jump rope today. Yeah, and yeah. back squats and back squats. Yep, that all would, of those things are very normal. Very <laughs> normal, very simple movements. Like, yeah, and I I have friends that are the same way. That then, like, actually, I just had this conversation with a colleague at work the other day, and she's like, "Oh, like I would love to try it, but like I need to lose some weight first. And I was like, "Let me tell you a story." No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> No, like you, really you do not. You absolutely do not. Like yeah, I think, people think they have to get in shape before yeah. they can come get in shape. Right. It's like this is what we're here for. Exactly. Exactly. You are here to get into whatever right. shape you want to be in. You don't have to like prep yourself. Which, to be honest, I feel like I probably thought a little bit of that though before I ever. I came think into it's a, it. definitely a common misconception for sure because people look at CrossFit and like they just think of those elite one percenters as the ones that are doing it. It's like no, like. We have 70-year-old members at our gym. Like, we have 12-year-olds. You know, we have ranges of all ages and athletic abilities all over the place. We have injuries. We have adaptive athletes. We have everything. Exactly. And, yeah, so it's it's not just stuff to, like... And that was, like, one of the first things I realized. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, wait, you're telling me, like, that workout that seems really difficult you're actually going to like tone it down mm-hmm. for what I need so I can still just do the workout. Yeah. It's not about like, are you lifting the heaviest? Which is, I think also miscon- misconceptions of like gyms in general. Sure. It's like people are like, oh, if you can't go in and throw a bunch of weight around and be some like bulky bro or whatever, it's like, ah, oh, then I, I don't really want to, if you can't do everything perfectly, I don't want to go. Right. And it's like, that's one of my favorite things about the gym is like, it's not about perfection whatsoever. Mm-mm. Like, yes, do the things right so you're not hurting yourself. Yes, it's do Get the movements well. Yeah. Absolutely, we're like we're gonna drill technique, and so you so you don't hurt yourself. But the cool thing is, is while we're drilling that technique or learning that technique, we're not adding a bunch of weight to a bar. No, something. it's literally like there's still to this day certain workouts where someone will be like, "Hey, just use the bar," mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Oh, okay, great." 
Yeah. Like, that's, that's great because I'm like, oh, yeah, because it's it's more about, like, am I, am I doing it right? Mm-hmm. Not, like, how much weight did you throw up today? Like, and I'll tell you what. Like, so this past weekend, I just did my level two CrossFit coaching which, certification. Yeah, congrats, by the way. Thank you. Dope. Thank yes. you. Yeah, it was big dream, finally achieved. Um, but I will say, like, in that, we spent probably – eight hours of the 16 hour weekend total over the two days with a PVC pipe in our hands. Yeah. I did more PVC pipe drills, like correcting movements and technique than I ever have over CrossFit. And it was a hell of a workout. Right. I, w- I have never been like drilled so hard with technique with a PVC pipe than I was in this class. Like right. I fought so hard in the bottom of a front squat trying to get my elbows up with a front squat. Like I was sweating. Yeah. <laughs> like, so no, it is not about the weight that you're doing. Right. Absolutely not. <laughs> so, okay. So you, you start in CrossFit like mm-hmm. 11 years ago. Mm-hmm. I want to. I, I actually want to go back a little bit further, even before sure. that. So, like, are you from Columbus or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, okay. We, my, my, I was born in Cleveland. Okay. Um, my family, we kind of moved around a lot from like birth until I was five. Um, my dad owned a chain of jewelry stores, so we moved around a lot. Um, but then we settled here when I was like five ish, I believe, um, and I've been here ever since. Okay, so. You, you already mentioned earlier, like, didn't really, like, you kind of jumped from, like, maybe sport to sport. You try things out. What was growing up like in general? Like, were you surrounded by, it, was it, was there, like, motivational people doing a lot of things? I mean, owning yeah. a jewelry store, like, I don't know. Like, does that kind of impact you in any certain way? No, or not, other than just kind of the moving around. But again, like, I was so young, I really don't remember yeah. much of that. Um, it's actually funny. I was talking to my mom a couple weeks ago and I don't even know how we got on this topic, but I, we were talking about like kind of that moving around as a child. And I was telling her like my very first memory that I ever have, if I think back to like my very first memory was when we lived in, um, New Hampshire and we lived in this condo on the beach. And I remember like looking out our balcony, it was like Christmas day and the beach was covered with snow. And that is like literally my very first memory. That's pretty sick. <laughs> it's kind of like, cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I don't remember much about like that time period. Really just, but growing up, I mean, I, my family was very religious. We were, I was very heavily involved in church uh, my entire life. Oh, well, until I could make a choice for myself, I feel like. Um, my grandparents, my grandfather was a pastor. Um, both my parents were music pastors at the church that we were at. Um, so really heavily involved with that, went to a Christian school from kindergarten through my sophomore year. Um, my brother, my brother was the athlete of the family. Um, so he was actually, he played basketball. He was an incredible basketball player. I think pretty sure like to this day, like still holds records at our old, the school that we went to. Um, but no, I just never really... That was just never my thing. Like, I don't know. I think maybe I just kind of saw him doing all of that stuff. And like my parents were so heavily involved and we were always going to like tournaments and games and traveling and all of this stuff. And I I feel like kind of maybe a part of me felt like I couldn't do anything. Like there wouldn't be time for anything that I would, I don't know. Like maybe that's just like my brain now looking back. And I mean, I don't know. Like I just, it was just never anything that I did. Right. I was just never the, I was never the athlete. So what was your thing? Was there any, like a thing that you were like, you know, I would, I would go to this. I was artsy or I was like, whatever. Mm. Or I was just like quiet to myself. No, like, yeah. yeah. I don't, I, it's, it's kind of weird to like say that, but I never really had like a niche or anything that I was like obsessed with. Like mm. I had friends. I, I, um, yeah, I, I like to read books. I was kind of a little bit of a loner, I would okay. probably say. Like, was never like the popular kid, like never anything like that. When I left my Christian school when I was a sophomore, I transitioned to public school um, for my junior and senior year, which honestly was great. I loved it. Um, made some friends that I still, you know, are still in my life. So, um, yeah, but no, like I never really, I can't even think of anything that, stands out that I was like, oh yeah, that was my thing. I so, never 
didn't really have a thing. <laughs> so, okay. So if there wasn't really a thing, like what, what are those years like, like graduating high school, going into the real world? Mm-hmm. Cause like one, I'm assuming is, is around then when you got to kind of make your own decisions, maybe on like the religious side of things of like what you did and didn't want to do. Yeah. Like, there, there was definitely a time when, you know, my parents stopped like, making me go to church. I was like, if I wanted to sleep in on Sunday, I could, like, I didn't have to go. Um, I still did like there, there's, I don't like to call it religion because I don't look at it that way, but I would say that God is still a part of my life, but in the way that I absorb it. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, but organized religion and things like that church, um, isn't necessarily something that i gravitate towards yeah. anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just, the best way that I can really describe it is, and this is why I, I said before, like, I kind of feel like it's uninteresting. Is like, it was just normal. Like my parents were married. My brother was, I mean, that's a whole other story, which we can talk about that. But um, I, I graduated high school. I started at, I started going to like community college. I was 17 when I graduated. So my parents didn't want me to go away to school right away. Um, so my plan at that point was to start taking classes at Columbus State, kind of get a little bit of credits under my belt at that point, and then transfer once I turned 18. Um, which that didn't necessarily work out because I met my daughter's father. We kind of had a little bit of a whirlwind shotgun wedding type of situation. Really? Okay. <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, of course I wouldn't know. It's not like you're like in class. Like, hey guys. <laughs> exactly. So of course I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. So I, um, yeah, I got married at 19. Okay. Um, had my, my oldest daughter um, when I was 20. So, and then I just became a mom and yeah. I was a mom and a wife through, uh, until I was about, well, I'm still a mom, but, <laughs> um, we were, yeah. So I had my two kids and just kind of, that was my life then probably through the, most of my twenties. Okay. So that's kind of what life obvi- I mean, yeah. obviously becomes. It's like, okay, I'm in mom mode now. Yeah, for sure. And so was it just sort of clearly, I know like obviously the answer is yes, you were leading with like, okay, motherhood time, time mm-hmm. to be a mom, all this sort of stuff. So outside of that, any, like, were you just kind of making decisions for any like career paths or anything like that? Was it just kind of based off of, does this help me be a good mom? Like, do I just, I just need to pay the bills. I just need to. Uh, I think it, a little bit of both. Like I, I always, uh, I was in nursing school, so that was my path. Like coming out of, um, out of high school, like that was my, that was my like path that I saw myself on was, you know, get some credit, my general credits under my belt and then transfer to a a bigger college for my nursing degree. That was my goal. I was working, I got my um, STNA, state tested nurses aid license when I was 16. I worked my way kind of just through my junior and senior year at a nursing home when I was in in school. So that's always just been what I thought was my path. Right, okay. Um, So, And even like through that, like even kind of like when I got pregnant and became a mom, like that was still kind of like that end goal. It was always like, well, I'll just take a little bit of time off now. Like I'm still working. Like I worked at the hospital for seven, eight years, somewhere in there. Um, And I would kind of always like, I would, I started, but when I started back to nursing school, um, it was shortly after that I got pregnant with my second daughter. (laughs) So it just kind of was like this thing of like, well, maybe this like, it just isn't my vibe right now. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe this is, maybe I'm just going to take a little break, but yeah. So that's, um, yeah, I just kind of just shifted into like full, full on mom mode at that point. Right. Okay. So when does, and obviously share what you want to share. Sure. When do things with like relationship and all that sort of stuff Mm -hmm. begin to change? And I ask that Mm -hmm. not to be like, let's air all the dirty laundry. No, it's totally fine. But I ask that because I I do think those things are important because, you know, I know like what, you know, I've experienced with, you know, having split parents Mm -hmm. or or what that dynamic is like. And I'm sure like a lot of people have experienced like, oh, you either experience it from one side or the other. You either live it and go through it or you experience it as the child or as sure. somebody, whatever. What was that time frame like for you? Be, I mean, because me trying to think about it, I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, young mom. And you've even kind of said it yourself. You're like, 
I kind of felt like I was set on the path. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm a mom now and I've got the job and I'm doing the job. This is the thing. Yeah. And I think it's, it's very weird and very difficult when we feel like we're on that path of like, okay, this is, this is, this is what I'm doing. This Mm -hmm. is awesome. And then when something changes, yeah, I feel like it's a hard thing to deal with. Absolutely. Um, so I won't go into like specific details of like why certain things ended, um, just out of respect to other parties. Um, but so I, so my first husband, yes, I've been married twice. Um, so my, my two older daughters, their dad, we separated when I was 25. So we had been married for about six years. Just, yeah, just shy of our seventh, um, anniversary. And at that point, um, that was probably the hardest like transition because, you know, being alone, my daughters were five and two at the time. Um, I had never lived alone before. Oh, wow. At all? No. I went okay, straight yeah. from living with my parents to being engaged and yeah. then living with my husband. So I had never lived alone before. I had never fully supported myself before. And then now I have myself and two children. Um, so yeah, that was, that was an adjustment for sure. And I, and it's funny because I look back on that time now and I don't know how I did it. Like Mm -hmm. I honest to God, don't like, I mean, I was, I was working at a hospital or at at an office job Um, when I left the hospital and wound up kind of moving into like a more of an office job environment, you know, supporting myself and two kids making 13 bucks an hour at 26 years old. Yeah. Like, I I don't know how I did it. (laughs) Wow. For that to be the first experience living on your own, Mm -hmm. like... Yeah. I've got a one bedroom apartment right now. And sometimes when my cat is too hyper, I'm like, life is so difficult. Yeah. You know, like yeah. That. I had a two bedroom apartment. I mean, my girls shared a room and it was just me. Um, thankfully, like my, my mom was fantastic. She um, came and stayed with me for a little while and just kind of helped me, you know, get back on my feet and kind of get schedules and all of that stuff. I had wonderful like childcare with all of that. Um, so I did have I did have a lot of really great support, um, but yeah, that was definitely a, a very 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 incredibly challenging time for sure. So as you're pushing through that and figuring that out, like what what comes next? Is it just like I, I'm still I'm just staying in mom mode. I'm staying mm-hmm. in work mode. Yeah, doing the thing. Like that was all I that was all I felt like I could do because I I had to provide. Um, so any thought that I had of like going back to school, all of that was still on the back burner. Like there was no there was no time in sight where I thought that that would even be a possibility anymore. Um, so once I, so this was kind of around the time of like my back injury and kind of going through all of that stuff too with the kids. And that was just, it's all everything. It was just all so, so much a lot. And my mom, I think again, like my mom was there and helping me through a lot of stuff. Um, and then once I like was cleared, like through all of the PT from the back stuff, I didn't want to go back into working at the hospital, um, kind of just mainly just out of fear of, you know, something like that happening again and getting injured again. So I kind of transitioned into, um, I started working for a home health, a small local home health agency. And I was just doing like scheduling and like human resource assisting type stuff. And that was it. And like, that was, that was my day. It was, it was work and it was home with the kids, work, home with the kids, work, home with the kids. And that was pretty much my life for the better part of, I would say like two years, maybe two, two and a half years, um, just paycheck to paycheck, you know, no money in savings, you know, myself eating like peanut butter and jelly. So my kids could have a little bit of a better meal, just doing anything that I could to just be a mom and be a good mom. So when you're talking specifically on the moment of like, you're going through those motions of Mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm in mom mode. I've got to provide, I've got to do all this stuff. Now I'm living on my own. Mm -hmm. I've still got to make this happen. Can you walk me through like, what was that time frame like specifically like around the back injury? Because like you said, like that, that's a lot to just pile on. Mm -hmm. That is a lot to sit and be like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this thing because like I, it, it, 
it's sort of like again like you were like okay i've now i've i was on this path mm -hmm. something changed i've now reset onto this path all right cool i've got it under control then you reset on that path and now there's something new mm -hmm. that is now on the way again of like okay now i'm over on this you, you kind of have to keep pivoting which yeah that that's life that's what happens sure. to, to everybody right but that's even why i'm asking like what was going through your mind during survival that time? just yeah Honestly, survival for, you know, myself and my kids, like I was in, I lived my life at, like for the year and a half to two years after my back injury, just in a constant state of pain. And, and as a, as a mom, like you, you never want to show that to your kids. And like, they were still very young. So, you know, who knows if they would have remembered anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I lived, I lived that life for almost two years, just constantly in pain every day. And so my whole thing <laughs> through that was survival for myself. And it, it took some dark turns for sure um, with my mental health for a little while. Um, definitely a struggle, you know, the days that I would wake up and not be able to get out of bed, um, you know, Definitely some dark thoughts surrounding yeah. all of that for sure. But at the end of the day, it was just, you know, survival. Two kids I have to take care of. Two kids that are depending on me for their survival. So I just had to keep going. Is those, like, are, are those, like, the dark thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not ask, obviously asking you to be like, tell me exactly what you're <laughs> But, like, I, you know, I, I would dare say probably most of us have, have sure. been there at different yeah. points in times. Like, what... What's going through your head in those moments? Is it that this is just too hard? Mm -hmm. Or is it like feelings of like, was it like not feeling good enough? Was it not feeling like, uh, wow, I can't, I, maybe I can't provide the way I want yeah. to. Like, what, what was it? Or I, was it like, I, I, I'm lost. I feel like I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. I think it was a little bit of all of that. It yeah. was a lot of, you know, because I'm, you know, I had gotten a divorce. And of course, you know, you don't no one thinks they're going to be married and divorced with two kids at 26. So it's, it was almost like a, okay, well, I failed at this and now I'm, you know, given my kids a, a broken family and how are they ever going to recover from this? So I felt like a failure in that, not only as a wife, but as a mother too. Um, so lots of, lots of feelings around failure for sure. Um, and again, just kind of like, I just had to keep going. I didn't. I didn't really know any other way other than to succumb to the dark thoughts, <laughs> which nobody wants to do. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I don't really know. Like it's it was a it was a tough time for sure. And now I know I'm taking us like out of the timeline. And no, fast it's forwarding it's good. Bit, but at what point in time do you feel like that sort of stuff began to like subside? Like was the, and not that, like, I'm not saying you never have a bad day now. Sure. Um, that that's always going to happen. We're always going to have off days and, and terrible days, bad mm -hmm. days, good days, great days, whatever. Do you remember the moment in time when th like that started to shift at all? Like when it wasn't, and again, if I'm jumping too far ahead and there's stuff you want to fill in, please just be like, let me tell you about this first. No, but, like, I, I feel like we're kind of right at that kind of at the tipping point of, and, and not to say that like. CrossFit saved my life, but I think focusing, kind of shifting that mentality into making myself a priority as well and taking care of myself mentally and physically and learning how to do that is where that shift started to happen yeah. for me. Um, Cause again, like I had never, you know, I would eat, you know, an entire thing of double stuff Oreos for dinner and be like, okay, well, that was, that's fine. That's acceptable behavior. Right. And, and then, you know, immediately hate myself afterwards. Right. Um, but I just didn't know, I didn't know nutrition. I didn't know fitness. I didn't know how to take care of myself. I, you know, had never been in a gym before. I didn't know. I didn't know any better. I just never really grew up around any of that. So uh, yeah. So I think when that, shift started to happen in my brain of like, I have to figure out how to take care of myself. Like I have to lose some weight. I have to get healthy. I have to start eating better. It was kind of this thing of like, okay, like it's, it's me and my kids. And yes, my kid's father is like still active and present. Like he's a wonderful father. Like we had custody and custody shifts and all of that stuff. But you know, how would I have felt if, you know, because I was so unhealthy and, you know, obese and 
just all of that stuff that I got sick or something happened and like my kids lost a mother because I wasn't taking care of myself. So once that shift started to really happen in my brain, I think is when kind of life started a little bit more on the upswing. How much value do you think there is in that, I'll just call it self-love? Oh God, it's everything. It's everything. It's, and it's something that I, I mean, still to this day, like struggle with for sure. I think we all do. Um, but I think it's like, it's like the bottom of the pyramid when it comes to life. It's what everything else is built on. And it, it's easy, especially even hearing the story right now, like real time, like it's easy to, when you, when you have to focus on being mm-hmm. in survival mode or you have to focus, not even maybe survival mode, but just like you are going to be in your own system, in your own cycle of like, this is what I do every day. This is what I need to do every day. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you feel like sometimes people almost make themselves feel guilty if they focus on themselves? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I I hear that a lot and I've heard that a lot over the years like with parents that maybe come to CrossFit or, or parents that, you know, use that as as an excuse for different kinds of things. Not not even just parents, but people in general just, you know, they they feel guilty like, "Oh, well I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I've already worked all day. I don't want to go to the gym after work or I don't want to go for that run or, you know, whatever whatever it is that they do that they do for themselves." because they don't, they feel like they're taking time away from their kids or their husband or their family as a whole, like whatever it might be. And, and if I could just like drill into these people's heads, like as much as possible that taking care of yourself is how you best take care of other people. If you are not taking care of yourself, if you are not healthy, if you are not satisfied with the things that you're doing in your life, like you can't give your best to anybody else. So that's not, how I feel. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I 100% agree. Like, and so not, not to say that like there was like one particular moment in this, mm-hmm. but do you remember when that light bulb moment happened for you at all? Like, do you, was there like a, a day or a series of events or just even looking back and like, you know what, these couple months is when I really started to feel a little bit better after I started taking care of myself. Like, did you ever have that kind of almost moment of being able to slow down and soak in wait, okay, I, I started doing something for myself now. Like, or, or hey, this does actually make me feel better mm-hmm. and I can see how it is positively affecting maybe the things around me, like family, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think it probably was maybe a few months because I didn't, I didn't jump into CrossFit right away. Um, like I said, I kind of started with some little baby steps on my own. Um, and it was maybe a few months or so kind of after I had started like, the walking and the light jogging and kind of starting to eat a little bit healthier and just those little things at a time. Like, I mean, I, you can't just, I mean, some people can, for me and my brain, I can't like change everything all at once and just like cold Turkey, all of the bad stuff. Like it, it had been a progression for me for sure. Um, but it was, it was a weekend. I was at the park with my kids and again, like my kids were young and I used to be the mom that sat on the bench and watched their kids play, you know, and this time I was running around with them and, you know, swinging on the swings and going up and down on the little playground thing with them and climbing the monkey bars or whatever it might be. Like I was just playing with my kids at the playground and I stopped and I was like, I'm actually do like, I can do this. Like, I don't feel tired. I don't feel like I'm out of breath. I don't feel like I need to go sit down. And that was and that was just like a few months or so probably after and it was like okay, like maybe something's kind of starting to work and starting to click and like I'm feeling better. Mm-hmm. And then it was shortly after that, you know, CrossFit happened and kind of started to go down that road and then it just those feelings just increased for sure. So do you feel like maybe do you do you feel like CrossFit was maybe your first thing? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. CrossFit was definitely the the thing for me. I, I've I've told this story a million times, and like, cause like again, like I never did anything before. I was never good at anything before. CrossFit was the first thing that I felt clicked for me, and that I felt like I was just kind of instinctively good at. Not to say that I'm the best. God knows I'm not. Um, but the different movements, you know 
kind of came fairly naturally to me. Like we all have techniques and things to tweak and all that stuff. And I still do like, you know, if you, Nobody's perfect. Ev- no, absolutely not. Um, but it was the first thing that I actually felt good at. Yeah. And that like it, and that m- meant the world to me. I was like, Oh my God, I'm like 20, nine, 28, 29, have I finally found like the thing that I'm good at (laughs) after all these years? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And it just, it made me so happy. And yeah, I think that was kind of when I found my thing. That was honestly going to be my next question was like, whether it's, whether it's looking back on it right now, or even remembering how you were feeling in that Mm -hmm. moment, like let's like, let's, let's put like family stuff aside Mm -hmm. or, or even being a mom aside, which I'm, you know, Sure, it's like a difficult, like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> oh, <it's> but, like, <laughs> you know, setting those feelings aside of mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm surviving and living for other people. Mm-hmm. And obviously children being the main thing. But sure. even before that, like you explained, you never really had a thing. Yeah. It was always just sort of like, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm around, I'm doing this stuff. I'm just sure, l- living whatever. my life. I didn't ask to be here, but here I am. Yeah, like, <laughs> what, what do you feel like, what did it feel like in that moment or looking back on it? Like, what did it feel like to finally have something for you? Like, cause to me, like, again, hearing this story right now, mm-hmm. I'm officially hearing like, Oh, like even the way you're explaining, it, you're like, yeah, like, I don't know. Childhood didn't really do a lot. Oh, when I was a teenager, I didn't really do a lot. Mm-hmm. Then I became a mom. And outside of that, I didn't really do a lot. Sure. This 100% sounds like the turning point where yeah. there was officially like, not just having something to do, mm-hmm. but having something that is like genuinely for you and about you. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's an incredibly important thing because it's not just it's not it's not just the act of something to do. It's not just going to the gym or just getting fit or getting in better shape or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and to be honest, like I don't even think it's just about being healthier for the kids or something. Mm-hmm. Like again, stripping all that stuff away. I feel like the importance is that like you found something for you Mm -hmm. and you finally, at least as an outsider hearing the story, it sounds like for the first time you were able to focus on you. On me. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And I think in that too, a big part of that was like the community that CrossFit brings and like, um, you know, meeting people, like-minded people that are going through the same hard things. Like everybody's got their own personal stuff going on, but everybody kind of comes together in that hour and they're doing the hard work. You know, you make friendships, you make connections. And I think that that was definitely a huge part of it for me too, is like that community support. Because again, that was something that I had never really had. Um, You know, growing up, kind of a bit of a loner, like not really, never really kind of put myself out there um, for tons of connections and friendships. Um, Had definitely, and probably still to this day, am like fairly guarded with certain things like that. Um, But this was kind of the first time that I had felt that start to go down. And that is like, yeah, again, just kind of like that huge turning point for me. And once I, you know, kept with it and had been, you know, at it for a long time, obviously the benefits started showing themselves pretty quickly with just increased fitness levels, the weight loss and all of that stuff. And it wasn't long until I was like, you know, like I have to give back to this somehow because of how much this has changed my life. Okay. So when, so when was that? Is that give back? Like, oh, I want to start coaching I want to be a part of that now yes okay. yeah so it was um it was around 2013 or so and this kind of leads into what I like to call like the next chapter okay. <laughs> um so I um I met my youngest daughter's dad my second husband and um he had just opened a, a brand new CrossFit gym in Pickerington Ohio so we had we had just met, um, kind of things with that kind of started pretty fast and furious. We I kind of I started at the gym, started coaching with him pretty quickly. Um, fell in love, got married, did all the things, had my daughter, um, and yeah, like that was our life. Like we were we were affiliate owners and CrossFit coaches. And we were very, very small, um, but we had a very like tight knit community at the time. Um, You know, my daughter was 
practically born in the gym. <laughs> like I, I remember I, uh, I actually coached cr- classes the morning that I went into labor with her. Like, wow. oh yeah, I, like I, I worked out my entire pregnancy. Like it was compared to my previous two pregnancies, like my, it was a piece of cake. I was like, I can do this all day. This is nothing. Like I maintained my fitness, coached like our five and 6 a.m. classes that morning, worked out afterwards from like seven to eight, went home, went into labor. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. So That's wild. it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, but yeah. And then, um, yeah, so that was, that was our life for, from 2013 until 2017. Like we had that gym and we were just, we were doing the family thing. Like we were a blended family. Um, you know, I had my two, he had his one, we had ours together, you know, yours, mine and ours. We had the gym. Um, we both had other jobs as well. So it was kind of like we had this schedule of like, you know, one week I coached mornings, the next week he coached mornings, we would kind of flip flop back and forth. And it was just kind of, it was just our life there for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And so did it, did it, it's probably a silly question, but like, did it bring that sense of like, ah, like, okay, this is like almost culmination in a way. Yeah. Nice. The hard work has paid off. The hard work is, is yeah, the hard work is done. Like here we are, like, I'm in love. Like we have a gym, like this, like dream has been achieved. We've got all these beautiful kids. Like everything is fantastic. And we just bought a house and like all of this stuff. I just felt like, okay, like life is coming together. Like shit makes sense now. This is perfect until it wasn't because <laughs> obviously I'm not married now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so again, barring details. Yeah, like, for sure. When does that change and what does that change now feel like? Like, Yeah, I mean, that, that changed in um, October of 2017. We had actually, um, we kind of had been through some changes like earlier, like kind of over the summer. Um, he had had some different career goals. Um, so we were kind of making some changes with the gym. We had actually just sold the gym to two of our other coaches that were working for us. Um, so they had taken the gym over, just kind of taken all of the, the ownership side of stuff kind of off of our shoulders. Like we, we had the baby and like, again, like through some other career goals of his, like we were just kind of shifting, um, And then, so that was in the summer of 2017 that like we kind of passed the baton onto our other coaches. Um, And then it wasn't too long after that, that it was the rest of things just kind of, and again, barring details, like it it was never the perfect relationship. I mean, nothing is, of course. Um, But it was October of 2017 that that kind of solidified its ending. And I found myself alone again. And now I was in this brand new house that we had just bought together with now three kids <laughs> and I'm back to being a single mom. So I feel like I've already asked you this question, it's okay. <laughs> but with each new change oh, yeah. comes each new group of emotions. Mm-hmm. And I'm also asking this from the standpoint of like, like I know how I handle changes like that. Mm. I know how I handle you know, and, and to, to a different scale, you mm-hmm. know, I don't have kids. I've never been married, but my comparison is just how I handle any just breakup in general. Mm-hmm. I'm a very, very, very emotional person. Mm-hmm. So I absolutely attach my heart and soul to things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not the person who's like, I don't like jump from relationship to relationship. I'm not just like, ah, fill the void. Who cares? Like I'm very like, does this feel right? Right. Which the hard part is, is when it does feel right and then when it doesn't work, and, yeah. it feels way worse. Because it feels like, right to you and 100% and it doesn't maybe feel right for them. And then it's kind of, yes. so again, that, that's not going to work. Right. Right. And so, you know, I'm asking this from the standpoint of like, I know how difficult it often is mm-hmm. whenever I deal with stuff like that. And outwardly, unless you're making it known not a lot of people will know Mm -hmm. like of course they might know something that happened but otherwise it's like oh you you seem like you're good and you can be like 
Yeah. Did you see me cry myself to sleep like, the other night? Yeah, like, sure. <laughs> you weren't there for those moments. And right. Like, I also tend to be a pretty transparent person with that stuff. Yeah. Like, I, for better or for worse, I can't really lie when someone asks me, when someone's like, hey, how are you? Mm-hmm. I can't lie. Yeah. I can't. If I'm having a bad time, I'm like, I'm all right. Well, yeah, you know? you're probably gonna see it on my face. Like I'm gonna say, like I'm all right or I'm fine, but yeah. you're gonna probably see the eyes glisten a little bit. Because <laughs> there's also probably gonna be a difference in how I'm carrying myself when I am great. Mm-hmm. Because I am gonna be like, I'm great. Like, how are you? Oh my yeah. gosh, let's you know whatever. Like, you're gonna see an energy difference no matter what. Sure. And I'm not a person who can fake that very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I do, I don't like doing it. You know, I, I don't like like tr- truthfully like going through life changes at the gym, Mm -hmm. you know, now for me, it literally is this like, yes, the the workout and and doing all that sort of stuff is one way of just like releasing and and focusing energy on something else and all that sort of stuff. And it does naturally make me feel better. But being able to share those emotions honestly Mm -hmm. with a community at a gym and obviously in specific, you know, CrossFit and Hannah, the gym Mm -hmm. that we go to, that like holds so much power Mm -hmm. and that over the last year has been one of probably the biggest things that I've learned is it's not just like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going in, I'm showing up for class or I'm going in, I'm doing a workout, I'm tossing headphones and I'm not talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the thing and I'm leaving, you know, even on days when I do go in for a quick, like I am doing the workout by myself because I got to go. Because I got to go. Yeah. You're not getting in or out without probably having a quick conversation with somebody who's going to sure. be like, hey, what's up? How are you? What are you doing? Like, you're here early. You know, whatever sure. it is, right? And I think that is one of the most valuable things that I've learned mm-hmm. is like, I know it's an overused term and it sounds like I'm just making it a commercial for CrossFit Games. Like, <laughs> I think any probably good We have a gym, 10-day free trial. <laughs> you can sign up at uh, CrossFitGames.com. Um, free like, plug. You're welcome, Ryan. I do have the shirt on. <laughs> you do. I almost wore my hoodie. I, I wish you would have. Honestly, I was going to point this out at some point. Good uh, twinning we got going on here. Right? We're, we like color coordinated. I like, well. I, I wasn't sure what the vibe was going to be. Like, I had on jeans initially, and I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like, yeah, no, you can <laughs> literally whatever you want. Uh, but I'm glad we color coordinated. Yes, this is perfect. Um, but, like, point being is like the, the power of, you know, when somebody can see that you're not having a good day, mm-hmm. because these are people that are seeing you nearly every day, every week. And when you walk in and they're like, hey, what's going on? Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, what's up? Are you ready for class? Are you blah, blah, blah? Like, and not that I've ever like, you know, no one's really sitting me down like, hey, Ross, open the floodgates of emotions here. Because I will. Here's some tissues. (laughs) Um, But even just like the small, like micro examples of conversations I've gotten to have Mm -hmm. with people in the gym. Whether it's people I've known for a while, like Dom, Mm -hmm. um, or someone that I've gotten to know really well in a small amount of time, like Brian, or anybody else that I've gotten to know relatively well that I share class with or whatever, it's so cool that those people care. Oh, yeah. And when they can, they can tell, you know, Mm -hmm. they can tell like, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. I saw you post this thing, or I, I heard, overheard you say this, or... I can just tell you're carrying yourself a little bit differently. Yeah. Let's talk about it. What, what, what is that? Mm-hmm. You know? And like, I think that is almost the hidden value of really finding yourself into any community. Any community. Yeah. Any community at all. Doesn't have to be across Picahanna. No. <laughs> it's like literally anything that, the added value that comes mm-hmm. is, okay, cool. I can maybe confide this in other people. Mm -hmm. And it's not about sharing it with them so you get an answer or a a solution to the problem. But there is so much power in the vulnerability of like, hey, I'm I'm just like not having a good time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the the struggle with me like through that time frame was that I didn't have that because we had had sold our gym um, and just like through some others. Like I had kind of taken a little bit of like a break. I wasn't kind of there as much. I wasn't really coaching as much at the time. So, and then again, like you can't keep secrets from all of that. I mean, everybody kind of knew everything. You tell one person, it goes down the the line of telephone. So there was, there was definitely a, a, a very large level of like embarrassment and I kind of, also think back to again like failure like here's another one or here's the second one and and 
So it, there was a lot of, just a lot of embarrassment and fear to really be open and vulnerable with anybody about anything. Um, and so for me during that time um, was mainly just a lot of isolation and like introspection for a long time. And again, kind of, again, feeling like a failure, feeling like not good enough, you know, what's wrong with me? Like all of those questions and conversations that you have with yourself in your head when things that you think are wonderful don't, aren't essentially. Um, so yeah, it definitely felt like a, a time period of like back at square one, like here, like, here we go again. And I was, I was 33, maybe 33, 32, 33, somewhere in there. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, like, here we go again. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really know what to do now. When that, that was even, I, I, I'm so glad you like brought it back to that, <laughs> on that like side tangent. No, like, it's oh, good. It's sad. It's weird. Huh? <laughs> um, but like that, that was honestly the original point that I was, you know, making or asking about was like, it's easy in those circumstances to, I feel like lose, I, I don't mean this in like a lovey dovey, like, oh my God, like super deep way, but like, mm -hmm. it feels like you lose a piece of yourself mm -hmm. when something like that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, in, or when a change of, of really any sort of any magnitude, especially that has one that has emotions tied to it, it's easy to feel like you lose a piece of yourself. But did you feel like you, like, did you feel like you lost any part of like a new identity that you felt like you had built? Like, mm -hmm. oh, here's this new version of me. Yeah. Like we were talking about, hey, things are going pretty okay. It's not that they're perfect because nothing ever is. Sure. But it's pretty solid. I've mm -hmm. got this gym thing figured out. Hey, cool. Family, ch children, all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. That becomes a new version of us. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to have a piece of that be chipped away. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It was, again, kind of back to, it just, I felt like wasn't really much of anything, you know, through my 20s and kind of like reinvented myself in a way, like in this positive way that I was, I was happy and my kids were happy and we had these, all these happy people around us. And, and then, uh, yeah, and it, it just, it definitely in a kind of in the blink of an eye was, was taken away and it was very devastating for sure. And it was like, okay, like this is the only thing that I've known now in that realm of happiness. Like this is the only thing that I've been in where I've felt happy. Yeah, the, the, the only way you know how to live the only way in this world. In this world, yeah. Is now, the, and now I have to learn. Now I have to do it like again this. on my own. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> definitely a struggle. Definitely um, lots of, you know, sleepless nights. Like I said, like in, in all of that for me, and this is also something that I still struggle with is this was, that was kind of the time frame where I, you know, like I said, didn't really feel like I had anybody, didn't really feel, kind of felt like, okay, I'm on my own again with the kids. And um, at this point in time, like, you know, my dad's family is, all over the place. Like my dad's in Florida, my mom's in Mansfield, my brother and I don't have a relationship. So there's just all these things happening where like family isn't really around. And so the family that I had now is back to just me and my kids, back to kind of like that survival mode of, okay, well, like now I have to, now I just have to be back in that survival mode of like taking, you know, of working. And at that point, like I, I had been coaching and I was like, well, now like I had been coaching like just because I loved it and I wanted to do it and I wasn't really doing it for the money, but it was like, okay, well now I like, I, I have to find like some kind of side gig. Like I, I have to have my full-time job. And if I want to keep doing CrossFit, like I have to find somewhere to coach that will let me coach. And that way I don't have to pay for CrossFit and I actually can have a little bit of a side income. Like it was a necessity at that point in my life that coaching was what I was also doing as like a second job, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, it's, you know, that's not kind of where I am now. And like now it's definitely more like that passion project back to what it has always been in my head. <laughs> that's not necessarily like a, a, a necessity anymore, thankfully. Um, but yeah, it, that, but 
back to what I kind of circling back to what I was trying to say is like, that was kind of where I think my, and what I still struggle with is like that self-isolation. So like when things, like you said, like you're an extremely emotional person and it's hard for you to, to, to hide that. And I feel like up until that point, it had always been for me too. And certain things like I, I, you may still know if I'm having a rough day, but for the most part, like you're not really going to know kind of what's going on with me. Um, and I think that's kind of where that started was like not feeling like I really had anybody to talk to and confide in. Um, so just like a lot of, a lot of lonely nights, uh, for sure. And that's actually after a handful of months of that, I was kind of like, you know what, Krista, how's this working out for you? It's not. How about we get some help? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I definitely kind of dove head first into you know some therapy, you know, just some kind of self help stuff for me and learning coping mechanisms and and stress relief and different techniques. And I had kind of let that self care part of my brain that had really taken over for a long time that was sitting in the back seat like for a little while too so do you think that's because you didn't have to use that self-care mode from a standpoint of survival anymore like once it became comfortable Mm -hmm. that you were in self-care mode Mm -hmm. it becomes less of a a thing we have to focus on it's more of like this is my default setting yeah i go to the gym i've got the fam i've got the whatever for sure yeah we had a routine we had all the stuff and then then i didn't yeah And so then you have to try and dig that. It's like, oh, where, like, okay, wait, I need to, and I'm saying this because I I know I've done this, Mm -hmm. is like, you have to remind yourself, okay, wait, what were those skills that I developed to be able to survive? But now how can I blend them with my new way of making it through something? Absolutely. Yeah. Like the, you're absolutely right. Like the, all of those things and like the self care and this motivation, like all of that had just was just routine. It was completely just part of my existence at that point. And then when all of that happened and, you know, you're kind of just, you're in the weeds with, you know, custody and divorce and all of this stuff. And like, you just feel like your whole life is uprooted and all of that took a back seat and getting that back was, was so challenging and like actually finding the motivation to, get myself out of bed and go to the gym or, or go to the gym after like anything like that, anything that involved putting myself first was like non-existent at that point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and do you think that's just because maybe we talked about this earlier already, but like, do you feel like that's consistently a struggle because that was never the way that you lived mm-hmm. for such a long time? Yeah. I think it's just like a default setting in my yeah. brain for sure. And it's just kind of that isolation and that protection of the just like, okay, like we're back in our little cocoon and we're just in survival mode and we're just doing what we have to do to make it through the day and make sure the kids are alive at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And which of course, I, I think you could probably say the same thing. There, there's not anything wrong with survival mode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's we, it's, necessary. Have, it's necessary. It's necessary yeah. sometimes right. depending on what people are going through for sure. And there can be short little spouts of it where, you know, maybe just a couple of days you're just like, oh crap, like this is, I'm just making it through the next couple of days and that's it. That's all, that's all I'm focusing. I'm just going to get to Friday. And then there's times when you're in it for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah. and fighting your way out of that is hell. And it's also like such a often slow process. Mm-hmm. Like it sucks that it's not mm-hmm. just like, okay, you know what? Tomorrow I'm stepping out. Like we're getting right. out. We got this. Right. Like, and how many times that like, I, I can't even tell you how many times I had said like, all right, like Monday, like we're snapping out of this shit. Like we're getting up, we're going to the gym. We're like starting the day up. No, Monday comes and like, I'm in my cocoon of like depression under the covers and yeah. Well, it's like, it's the hard, the hard thing is that, you know, and I don't know if this is like correct terminology, but this is what I label them as. It's like you, you can understand what like positive triggers for yourself will mm-hmm. be going to the gym or for me, it's having conversations with people. It's, you know, when I'm feeling down or I'm having like a, you know, depressive episode or something I do, like just a funk, mm-hmm. I will often like make myself schedule 
a meeting with somebody, and I don't mean business meeting, just a meetup Mm -hmm. um, over coffee or food or hangout, whatever it is, where I know I'm going to have a solid conversation with them because I know I'm aware that that will add to my cup. It will add a little bit of water back to my cup that's now been empty, right? That's awesome, yeah. And so, like, I think, one, it's one thing to be able to identify those things Mm -hmm. and let yourself lean into them, even if you don't really feel like doing it. You know, there's a lot of times during those modes where I'm like, oh, I hope this person cancels. Like, I want them <laughs> Did to, you hope I was going to cancel them. tonight? <laughs> Honestly, no, because we've tried this like two or three times before. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 this needs to happen. We're doing it. <laughs> um, but like, the, you know, there, there's a lot of those times where I'm like, man, mm-hmm. can they just text and just say like, hey, yeah. I can't make it. So then, then it lets you off the hook. Oh yeah, so for like, sure. Oh, okay, I, I can just, I don't have to do this. But yeah. like, the harder part is that sometimes doing those positive triggers it's hard to, it's a hard pill to swallow to know that they don't solve the problems. Right. It can add a little bit to you. It can bring your energy up a little bit. It can mm-hmm. make you feel a little bit better. But that's a lot of the times, like sometimes I get caught up in that mm-hmm. where I'm like, just like you were saying, Man, Monday, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to kick this day off. Right. I'm going to do yeah. this thing, blah, blah, blah. And I'll do those things. And while I'm doing them, I'm feeling the return. I'm like, this is good. Like yeah. man, being at the gym feels great. Having this conversation with this person feels great. Uh, doing this creative thing, whatever it is, having this outlet feels great. But sometimes those things can be like, they they can add to you, Mm -hmm. but they can also be disguised as distractions. Mm -hmm. Because then the moment you're done with them, you feel maybe a little bit better, but the main thing that you're worried about or sad about is still there. It's still there. And that's what's hard. That's what's hard. And that's, that's what I think was the most challenging for me was kind of getting to that, that root cause of like, why am I feeling this way? Why are these my default, you know, protection modes that I go in? And and yeah, because you're just kind of using it as a mask at that point. Mm -hmm. And until you kind of get to the root cause of that stuff and really like dig down deep and do the work and truly focus on just, again, like self-care or, you know, for me it was, it really was like, therapy and counseling and just working through a lot of shit and trauma, whether that was from childhood or relationally or anything like that, Relation, relationships, whether it was romantic or, or friendships or anything like that. You know, I feel like there was a lot of stuff that was just stuck there. Mm-hmm. And after the, after my, the, you know, the, my second divorce, it was like, okay, like there's, there's just some stuff that needs to really be like unpacked here. Like I, 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 and now like, I mean, I strive every day just like to be the best me that I can possibly be every day. And I falter a hundred percent every day. Like <laughs> I am, n- nobody is perfect and certainly not me. And, and I struggle with a lot of it, but at the end of the day, like my intentions are always good. And I always want to like try to put my best foot forward with everything. And I, I can honestly say that that was probably never like my mindset until the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's hard because often you don't get to learn that way of thinking or that way of living or that way of solving problems or whatever mm-hmm. until there's a bunch of terrible shit that you have to yeah, experience. For like, sure. That's, I think that's what's like, you know, a, a lesson that I recently learned in, in life via things happening is like nothing is certain. Mm-hmm. And like, it sucks because like, I, I feel like I spent the last two years really focused on me Mm -hmm. where like years before that I was focused on me, but I was more so focused on like uh, a projected version of me that was like, I'm super busy. I'm grinding it out. I'm, I'm, I'm getting career things set up, which was great. I'm glad I did. Yeah. You've done super well Um, for yourself here. (laughs) You Um, you know, I'm glad I, I, Mm -hmm. you know, hustled during that time, but I was never really focused on me. I was focused on things that I was doing. Mm-hmm. And yes, that fed me in good ways where I was like, oh yes, this is, I feel good because I'm doing these things. But it was always kind of like external feeding in rather than internal feeding out. Sure. Right? Like how am I really, how am I projecting my life via feeling good on the inside 
rather than I've got all this stuff on the outside that makes me feel good. Mm-hmm. That's good enough. Yeah. Um, and so like for the, for me, the last two years was like a lot of shift in that. And mm-hmm. that includes obviously things like going to the gym and, you know, doing those sort of things where I feel like I became the new best version mm-hmm. of myself. And I know that's always going to change. I know that's always going to evolve. Yeah. Um, I know that best is going to look different daily or yearly or monthly or whatever it may be. Sometimes mm-hmm. the best is here. All, also, the best is also down here. Yeah. It's just whatever in that moment your best version your is. Your best version is whatever you have to give that day. If you, whatever you have to give that day and you give it, like that is your best. Yeah. Like, like I've, I've seen this, you know, posted around uh, like social media and stuff. But like it's like the saying of like uh, if you tried your best and you felt like you were only at 40% that day, mm-hmm. you didn't give 40% you gave your 100%. Sure, absolutely. Even if that kind of looks like only 40% of a normal day, Mm -hmm. you still gave your 100% in that moment. And, you know, I focus so much, finally, kind of in similar ways that we were talking about with you, is like, I finally focused on me. Mm -hmm. What are things that I want to do? You know, something I realized is that I didn't have any hobbies because Mm -hmm. every hobby I picked up, I turned into a career, <laughs> like, which is cool. Yeah. I'm not complaining, but I wouldn't just let myself just do something for fun. Yeah. I wouldn't just, just try a thing. I wouldn't just practice a thing, whatever. And so between that and things like going to the gym and things like really focusing in on like what makes me happy or what does that best version of me look like? Mm-hmm. And not that I have to find that perfect version, but as long as I'm working towards it, working that's towards it. better than not, mm-hmm. right? And doing all of that sort of stuff. And then the hardest part, and again, back to the lesson that I recently learned, is like when you achieve that goal or you achieve that version of yourself you want to be or that version of your life that you're like, oh, this is rad. Finally, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And then when you lose those results, it's really, really hard. Yeah to Mm re-identify of like, and it's not about the wins or like a trophy or a reward or whatever, Mm -hmm. but it's like, oh man, I made it here. This is so awesome. I'm proud of myself. This is like the life that I've been wanting and looking for and all this sort of stuff. And then when that goes away or a portion of that or a piece of that or whatever changes or goes away, Mm -hmm. it's super hard (laughs) to like (laughs) reestablish and remind yourself like, no, 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 I'm still me. Yeah. I lost a piece of something that was important or that I, that, that seemed like it held a lot of value, like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's hard to like learn to fill that cup back up again. Absolutely. And I, I, I definitely feel like that is, that is like where I've struggled the most is, is taking everything that I've learned over the years and truly being like, I'm still me, like no matter what happens, no matter what's going on. I mean, cause there's, I mean, there's been stuff we haven't even talked about yet. I mean, like my, you know, my relationship that I was in after my divorce, my previous gym, like all of these other things, it's like re-identifying myself. Like here's a brand new path in my life, a brand new life that I'm living. And then that's over. And then now it's like, okay, now I'm over here. And, but at the end of the day, really accepting that, regardless of whatever is going on around me or on the outside or where I am, like internally, like mentally, physically, like I am still me. And that has been really hard Mm -hmm. (laughs) to, to identify what that looks like and, and who I really am and what I want and what I love and what are my, if you, if you were to ask me right now, like, what are your hobbies? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't have any, like same thing. Like the only hobby that I had was CrossFit. And then I turned it into like a second job <laughs> like, and like a, like something that I love to do. And so I don't know, like I'm still learning all of this stuff about myself and it's, scary but it's exciting yeah. too like it's a very weird like dichotomy with all of that <laughs> I think, like, the important part is being aware that we're learning yeah because i i don't know if a lot of people honestly do that I, mm-hmm. I i think it is easy to um and i'm not saying this is bad i'm just saying it's it's easy to you know find yourself a new predicament settle into that predicament mm-hmm. find yourself a new predicament settle into that predicament yeah. rather than kind of almost add 
parts and pieces to yourself from each thing that then builds a version of you that like you're the thing that exists through all these circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily you are the circumstances or you are that like, yes, it might break some pieces off of you, but you can also learn something from those things. Yes. Learning those lessons sucks. Yeah, like, for sure. It's not fun at all. But like that, that's kind of the constant thing that I always remind myself of is, is honestly just what you were saying of like, I'm still me at the end of the day and I might be a little, a little like more tattered and beaten up yeah. version of me than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. But I think I know how to keep pushing and I think I know how to kind of keep going. Yeah. And I think that's okay if that comes from like major life changes or small life changes or like whatever. Yeah. I think it's like funny actually. I have a tattoo that's kind of like represents that a little bit on my arm. It says, it says I'm broken, but the okay and broken is like bold. Yeah, yeah. So it's like broken, but okay. And like, I definitely feel like that's been my path throughout life is a lot of, a lot of bad shit has happened. And, but at the end of the day, like, I'm here, I'm okay, my kids are okay, my kids are happy. You know, I, I've i worked my way up without a college degree to an incredible job and I, you know, coaching and all of this things that I love, like things are, things are good, Yeah, things are good. And having those reminders on the shitty days mm -hmm. is like, it, it is, it's still a double-edged sword because you're like, all right, things are good, but damn, this thing sucks. This thing still really sucked and I'm still thinking about it. Yes. <laughs> but at least having the, like being able to even identify mm -hmm. the like, the self-worth or the self-love or the self-growth yeah. um, or the things that you've built for yourself around you. Yeah. Like being able to even remember those things, mm -hmm. have reminders of those things. I think at a default setting, at a super simple term is just like, those are insanely important. Like those are things that like, you know, recently I've been you know, putting some work in to remind myself of like, yeah. okay, I get to do these things and I've, I've worked for this and it's working or I've succeeded in these ways or I'm getting to keep growing in these ways. Yeah. And like it's, but it is that constant back and forth of like, okay, Hey, that's what life is. Sometimes things happen, you experience things. And even trying to like look at like the positives of things, mm -hmm. like even if something ends in a way that you didn't necessarily want it to or end at all, right? Still trying to look at like, okay, well, what was what were the good parts of that? Yeah. And yes, there were bad parts. Those are easy to acknowledge. Sure. Those are the easy things to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt myself with that. I'm gonna I wanna remind myself. <laughs> like, oh, that's I'm gonna fall on the sword real quick. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um. And in a weird way, it's like the, the, the that's hard to deal with. But mm -hmm. in a weird way, the harder thing to do is to push past that yeah. and be like, okay, what was what was the good that came from that, right. or what were the good moments that I experienced during that? And then even if it ended up really bad, is there a good lesson that I learned out of that? Absolutely, and I think that that's that's one of the biggest things that I've kind of prided myself on over the last year and a half or so is that is that self-awareness surrounding all of that with me. Like, yes, like all of these things happened, you know, bad, shitty, good, worse, whatever it might've been, but just taking all of the bad and still trying to focus on the good and just being self-aware and, and knowing my, my struggles and the things that I do still struggle with and knowing that it's okay to ask for help when I need it. And that was something that I would have never done like two years ago. Like I would have just like sat in the muck by myself and like isolated and not talked to anybody and just been like, all right, I'm just dealing with this by myself and it's fine. And cause that, you know, you don't want to be a burden to anybody. Like everybody has their own shit going on. Like you don't want to add to anybody else's plate and that's been that's been probably one of the hardest lessons I've learned is that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to reach out when you need it. Yeah. What do you feel like during any of these changes, whether it's like most recent or, or anything, maybe a, an, an accumulative thing, what do you feel like uh, has been some of the most important stuff that you feel like you've uncovered or learned through these things? Um, I kind of just to that is um, asking for help and and reaching out, um, sitting 
in the in the hard stuff is really, really uncomfortable, but also really, really necessary. Like I think you maybe mentioned it before, like just kind of blowing past stuff and, you know, being like, oh, nope, I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm just going to shove that down and deal with it another day and we're not going to worry about it. And I think that one of the hardest but most important things that we can do is like is sit with that, whether it's, you know, trauma or grief or just a stupid bad day, like just sitting with that, unpacking our own feelings about it, dealing with it, kind of processing things and just letting ourselves feel those emotions. And I know for me that that was, it took a really long time for me to be able to identify kind of what I was feeling around certain situations and things and, and then letting myself feel those emotions. Like nobody wants to be sad. Nobody wants to sit in their room and cry, but I'll tell you what, I felt a hell of a lot better sometimes after that good cry and mm-hmm. after letting myself feel those certain things. So I think that end of the day, the biggest things that the biggest things that life has, has taught me is is just that is sitting with your emotions and feeling your feelings and asking for help and just reaching out and 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 accepting love and a community of people that want to be there for you mm-hmm. and not being just have ever, having everybody at arm's length. Yeah. That and all of that I feel like is is honestly why I kind of do wear my like emotions on my sleeve mm-hmm. a little bit. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I do I feel like there is so much value in just talking about things, mm-hmm. in just getting something off your chest. And yes, it is hard to like, am I burdening this person with yeah. the blah, blah, blah? But like a lot of the times I'll even preface like an emotion dump on someone of like, hey, I don't need a solution from you. <laughs> I don't even need advice if you don't want to give it. I just need to literally take this and expel it from my body. Yeah. Like in the, in, in the same way, this might be a silly comparison, but in the same way that you would throw up something that's making your stomach sick, I think there are ways to do that with your emotions. Oh, that makes so much, that makes so much sense. Absolutely. Whether that's journaling or Mm -hmm. just talking to someone like that's why like, and and sometimes it does make me feel weird because I'm like, man, like, am I that friend who like goes to a friend every time I'm sad and I'm just like, I need to talk to you. I need to say this (laughs) thing. But I'm like, also at the same time, like I like being that for other people Yeah. because I know the value of it. Like, and mm-hmm. you know, it's not like every single problem I ever have. I'm not, you know, going to someone like, let me tell you what happened today. Right. It's the big things. You know, the sure. things I'm like, when you can identify like, I can't do this one alone. Yeah. Can't do this one alone. So I just need you to hear me. Mm-hmm. That's all I need. I think there is a lot of, and ad- a lot admitting of in- that is yeah. like super hard mm-hmm. as well. Admitting like, I can't do this alone. I need help. Yeah. That's it's, huge. It's, it's And that is, there's so much self-awareness around that in and of itself for sure. And that's like 100% what I was just like about to say is like the, the understanding the strength and vulnerability mm-hmm. is like, I'm not saying everybody has to dump all of their life secrets to someone they're talking about when they're bummed, but just like sl- even slowly learning how to share those things mm-hmm. because that kind of emotion dump or whatever you want to call it, like that can kind of form a stronger connection with somebody who then can become a better support system. Like I just had this conversation via uh, Instagram the other day with somebody who, um, you know, I had recently like, again, I'm open. I'll share like, Mm -hmm. you know, not details of everything, but I'll share when I'm not feeling great. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, shared something on Instagram. just like, Hey, like I'm not really, I'm not feeling like myself. I feel like I'm, I'm a little lost trying to figure some things out, trying to get back on track. It's not great. And that spawned a bunch of very positive conversations. Mm -hmm. And one of those conversations, you know, someone was like, man, like, I just can't do this. Like, I just don't, I ball up. I, I, I isolate. Mm -hmm. And like it, you know, it wasn't me being like, no, share all your feelings like me. (laughs) It's not that. But like the conversation revolved around just me being like, well, like you got to remember, like you sharing anything is kind of a positive, like Mm -hmm. making, like being vulnerable about vulnerable about something can honestly help. That's scary and it's mm-hmm. hard. And again, you don't have to give them every single detail of the story. Sure. But just letting somebody know that like you're having a bad time, you're having a tough time, you're you're struggling with something, whatever. Mm-hmm. Most of most of the time, people are willing to listen or oh, to yeah. give advice or opinions or like whatever. And even if you know they're not giving you a solution, that's okay. 
that's like not a bad thing yeah. to connect with somebody over those sort of things. To Absolutely. To like lean into that vulnerability a little bit of like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just not having a good time. It's not working for me. Yeah, for sure. And actually not to, again, not to continuously plug CrossFit Canada, yeah. <laughs> but I remember like, so when I, when I came there in February, I kind of said at the beginning how, you know, my gym had closed and I was like really struggling to just kind of feel like a connection. I, that gym had just meant so much and the people there and, so coming to a new place and, you know, people that I don't know and coaches I don't know, athletes I don't know, and a brand new gym and all of it just felt very foreign and very uncomfortable for a long time. And it, it almost kind of shifted like my mindset of like for CrossFit, I was like, maybe this just like, isn't like my thing anymore. Like maybe kind of was like falling a little bit out of love with it. Like, was showing up and coaching and kind of going through the motions and whatnot, but there definitely wasn't like a lot of passion there. And, um, I remember I was like kind of, kind of toying with the idea of just like stepping back for a little while and just like, maybe I just need to take a break. Maybe I need to let myself grieve that loss. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped in here so quickly. And I remember I like, I sat down with Brian one day and I was just like, I need help. Like, I don't love this anymore. Like, I am struggling. Like, I don't know if this is where I want to be, where I'm supposed to be. Like, I am just, I'm struggling. Like, I don't, I don't love CrossFit right now. I don't want to work out. I don't really want to coach. Like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I need help. And like he was like immediately like so receptive and like just kind of jumped on it. Like, okay, like what can we do? Like, how can I support you? What do you need? Like he dragged me to the gym a couple times, like getting me in there, like working out with me, like partner workouts, like kind of just like forcing me to get back in there and, and, and do the work and do some stuff and, and was just like checking on me consistently and, you know, telling me that, you know, we want you here, we need you here. Like, you know, we want to support you. And, and I think that that was kind of like that, a little bit of that tipping point for me with Gehanna is where I was like, okay, like maybe these, maybe I, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like maybe I can, maybe I can fit in here. And I feel like it is still a little bit of a struggle um, sometimes, but you know, it's at the end of the day, like it's the community is what keeps bringing me back for sure. And so even looking forward with all of that, like, like you just got your level two. Mm -hmm. So like when you do think about this stuff in the future, think about like next phases or next chapters or whatever, mm -hmm. like it is the goal to try and coach more. Mm -hmm. Is it, I know we were talking about this a little bit before we recorded, yeah. um, of like, you know, what your schedule is like, like juggling everything, sure. you know, like, uh, what I'll just label as like, you know, day job, uh, motherhood, mm -hmm. doing normal life things and trying to coach CrossFit, all that sort of stuff. Is, is the goal to, like, just better maintain that balance? Is there anything, like, new or different that you're wanting to try and implement into things of, like, yeah, I, or I want to coach full-time or mm -hmm. I want to go part-time at this job and more at the coaching? Like, if you are looking forward with the balancing act of mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff, like, is there anything on your mind, like, when you do think about that, that, like, oh, you're yeah, towards? Oh, yeah, for or? sure. I wouldn't say that it's anything that I'm, like, working towards right now. Um, I feel like a hundred, I feel like right now, like, my, just my goal is to maintain that balance and live a life that allows me to provide for my family and be an athlete, be a coach, be a good mom, you know, do the, activities that I enjoy. Um, but there is that piece in the back of my mind that, you know, full-time coaching or maybe not even full-time coaching, but maybe, maybe more one-on-one -on -one type of coaching, more personal training type stuff. Um, beginner athletes coming into the gym, um, working with, with those newer people. Um, I think that that down the line, big picture goal is definitely there with that. If I could be a full-time coach, 100%. Like, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Like, I hope nobody at my job hears this. <laughs> like, yeah. I would quit my job tomorrow um, and, and coach full-time if I, if, if I knew that it could provide, you know, the financial stability that I need. Because mm -hmm. 
because again, it's like not just me. It's like those everything else that I have to think about. So, but yeah, full-time coaching would definitely be the goal. I mean, I have plans for my level three. Um, I have to, th- there's stipulations and all the stuff around. I have to get quite a bit more coaching in, um, which is weird to say because I've been coaching for like eight years, but like they have so many strict requirements okay. around that. Um, but yeah, so plans for that are in the works and I want to definitely do that and just continuing with any kind of ongoing education, whether that's with my actual day job, that's with coaching. I'm actually looking at doing the um, CrossFit weightlifting course that's in February. So any kind of ways that I can just continue to grow like personally, professionally, like that's just, that's kind of where my mind is right now. So obviously, you know, barring the perfect setting that we can sometimes give ourselves in our heads, like where do you feel like you're at right now with all of that stuff? Like, do you feel like, like maybe not necessarily that comparing is the right thing that Mm -hmm. we want to do, but looking back in comparison to the rest of the story. Sure. Like right now, are you like, hey, you know, another major life change comes my way, I'm not going to be stoked about it. <laughs> but I do feel better equipped. I do feel like that, I, that, that balance I'm trying to maintain is a little easier to balance, yeah. even if it gets kicked way off at some point. I like that you just phrased it that way. Like, yes, ideally, please no more like massive life changes. Um, but should something happen, yes. I definitely feel a lot more well-equipped with my emotions and like the tools and everything that I've put, like gathered over the years to help deal with those situations is, is definitely a lot better than it's been in the past for sure. Right. Um, but I think at the, you know, at this point in time, yeah, like I, I feel good. I feel secure. I feel happy. I feel content with where I am in pretty much all aspects mm-hmm. of life. And it took almost 39 years to get here. <laughs> and sometimes, that's yeah, good. that's there's the, zero wrong with that. Sometimes, yeah, yeah it takes t- dealing with a lot of stuff to mm-hmm. officially uncover, like, all yeah. right, what do we have inside of exactly. us? Exactly. Sometimes we have to peel that back and peel it back and peel it back. And and it's, it, I it, it think it's really, it means a lot to myself, to me, that I can say that because I feel like the other times in my life where I have said that, I've, been like supported by or had additional support from like not I mean I, I I am with somebody I have a boyfriend but like in terms of like marriage there's been like additional like support with that I've had another person like a, a partner right there in terms of like a family and, and a household and all of that mm-hmm. so it's it kind of to a to a point like almost feels like I've got to this point and like I've done it now on my own. And again, yeah. like not a hundred percent on my own for sure. Like not to discount anything, but it's a different level of like, just feeling like I did this. Like I got myself to this point. Yeah. Um, I've, I've did the work I've, I'm supporting my family. Um, so it, it feels good. It yeah, feels good. Of course. It's just giving yourself credit for the work that you have done. Mm-hmm. Like, cause the thing is, is like, even when we have support systems, um, whether they're good or okay or bad, even or whatever mm-hmm. it is, um, even if you're leaning on somebody else or you do have that system around you, it doesn't always mean that you're going to do something with the support that they give you. Right. So I still think at the end of the day, like it's still, still us that yeah. makes the decision to do something with it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like something that I have engraved in my brain that I have said a billion times on this show is that you know one of the biggest things I learned is like, what happens doesn't matter, your reaction to it does. Mm -hmm. And I have ingrained that in my brain. (laughs) And so I think that works even with good things. You know, there can be, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of cases of of tons of different people in their lives and all this sort of stuff of people had a support system, but they still, something still went wrong. Something was still bad. Something was still off. They didn't really find the help or get the help or make the change or Mm -hmm. whatever. That's because it's still still up to us. Yeah. In the in you know at, at the end of the day, and so yeah, I do think it's incredibly valuable to give yourself the credit mm-hmm. and and really realize like okay, I, I've unlocked this. Mm-hmm. Like I've officially unlocked this part of me. Yeah. 
that again, it's not perfect. It's not always going to be made of steel. When something hits it, it's going to, it might bend, it might break again, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I know that I can figure it out. Can figure, yeah, definitely. The tools are in your toolbox now that exactly. you can figure it out. You can work through it. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, like you just said, like I'm the one that has to look in the mirror. I have to be happy and content with the person that's staring back at me. And, and I, I always want to be, like I said before, like just continuously putting my best foot forward, whether that's that 40% one day, because that's all I've got, mm -hmm. or if it's 100%, like I just, I want to keep moving and growing and, and just doing the best that I can. And some days that's going to look like survival mode, but now I know how best to handle that exactly when, the, when those days happen. It's still something. Yeah. It's still something. It's still doing something. And even like from an out, outside perspective, like we, you know, I've, I've been coached by you at least a handful of times. Mm -hmm. um, we've done classes together and, you know, I've been around you, I would say at least enough. And even after having this conversation, like from an outside perspective, let me give you some compliments for a second because I do <laughs> think it's good to I, identify. I, I don't take them well. You don't take them well and that's okay. <laughs> But everything that I've ever experienced from you, being around you at the gym or even this conversation, whatever it is, like, to me, it all feels confident. Hmm. Even if it comes from a place of maybe a lack of or a difficult time getting there, mm -hmm. I say that because I feel like I can probably give the same thing mm -hmm. to a lot of people. And it's not faking it. You know, I, I don't, I don't, it's like, I wouldn't fake it and I don't really feel like you would be faking it either. Mm -mm. But any time from the start, like that's why, that's why we're now sitting here. Mm -hmm. You know, we started this by you being like, I don't really think I have an interesting story. And it's like, <laughs> all right, that's okay. But the conversation's still going to be interesting and we are going to get an interesting story. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. If I didn't, I don't know, sense that, or if I didn't, um, I don't know, if I didn't believe that there was value in what I felt being around you or interacting with you or becoming friends with you or whatever, there wouldn't have been a point to dig in deeper or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? For so sure. it's like, that's even something that like, anytime we are in the gym together, I genuinely, I will say this, I get stoked when I am at the gym at the same time you are. Oh, I literally am like, oh, Chris is here. Like, <laughs> heck yeah. Like, there's just something about it that's just like, oh, like you bring a good energy, whether you're having a good day or not, I couldn't ever tell you. You know what I mean? Unless it was like really obvious. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to tell you, and especially when you're coaching. I said this earlier, but like, I think you do a tremendous job at coaching. Like, you're Thank absolutely, you. that is a thing you're supposed to be doing, like, for sure. Thank you. And, like, obviously, I can't speak for everybody, at least for me. Mm -hmm. This might be a silly way to describe it, but the best way I can describe it is like, I feel like when you're around at the gym, I get like a big sister vibe. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's funny. I've actually heard that before, and that is so. Such a compliment for me. Like yeah, that okay. is, I just, that is what I feel like. I just feel like I just want to wrap everybody in a big hug that's, and just like be supportive. <laughs> well, add, add this to the list of people that have told you that. That's a hundred percent. Like that's why I get stoked when you're there. I like there's that. just this sense of like, there is a sense of like wrapping everybody in a big mm -hmm. hug. There is this sense of like comfort almost of like, all right, cool. If I'm doing this wrong, Krista tells me I'm doing it wrong. Like it's all good. Not that anybody else ever makes it uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. This that gym is probably the most comfortable place doing uncomfortable things that I've ever been. Hundred percent, yeah. So everybody does a great job. Don't let me like misconstrue that. Um, but there, there is there. There's just something that like I feel like from day one of being coached by you or working out alongside you, I get that sense, and it is a mixture of. I feel like again, whether it comes from a difficult place or not, I feel a sense of confidence in you. And again, that also leads into that big sister vibe, <laughs> that like safety vibe, that like, hey, we've all got this together mm -hmm. or hey, I'm going to help you figure this out or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, know that in future workouts, if we ever partner up or something, I'm super fucking stoked. I'm like, hell yeah, I got Krista. Like, Are you going I'm, to the gym tomorrow? Because it's I, a partner yeah, workout. It is a partner workout. Yeah. I will be the, I'll, what's tomorrow? Thursday? Thursday. I'll be at the 1130. I'll text you. Okay. I check my meetings for tomorrow. Let me know. <laughs> Let me know. I'll just be walking around I'm like, oh, it's a partner workout? Yeah, let me wait for my partner, Krista, to get <laughs> We're going to do great. Oh, I love that. That, seriously, like, 
there is a camera so you can see like the huge ass smile on my face. Like that makes me feel so good. Like that is a hundred percent like how I want people to feel when they're around me. Like, again, like I love that you say that I'm calm. I feel like I am. Um, We all have our insecurities, of course. Totally. Um, But I feel like, especially in that place, like I, 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 I feel like I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm glad that that comes out. And like that big sister comment, that is just like, I'm, that's going in my pocket. Thank you it. for that. I love yeah, it. Yeah. That's <laughs> that is good. That is good. Because I, like, I never had a sister. Like I was, I never got to be a big sister. So I feel like I, I do kind of just treat everybody like that. Like, and see what's my funny? friends have said that before. Like, yeah, I, I totally, I love that. What's funny is opposite for me. I'm the oldest of all my siblings. Okay. I've never had an older sibling. Mm-hmm. So whenever there's something like that, it excites me a little bit more. I'm like, oh, this feels like my big brother. This feels like my big sister. <laughs> like, this is cool. Is this what this feels like? This, Amazing. This fantastic. Like, yeah. I, just, I love I don't it. Know, I, I love those. Uh, I just love that, that support or that feeling of connection or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm like, so I always get excited of like, oh yeah, this is like big sister vibe. Like that's, that's totally <laughs> what it is. So you got it. Well, um, thank you. That's fantastic. Before we wrap up, yeah. last handful of questions for you. Okay. So if you could go back to any point in time in your life, time travel, mm-hmm. you right now get to go back and tell a past version of you something. You get to share something with them. You get to give them advice or tell them whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Where are you going and what would you tell them? What would you tell that past version of you? Oh, goodness. Um, I would probably, the first thing that comes to mind is when I brought my first born daughter home from the hospital, I was just barely 20 years old and I was terrified. Like, so terrified. Like I had my husband there with me. Right. But I was so terrified to the point where that first night home from the hospital, like I called my mom and I made my mom come over and like spend the night with us. And I just remember being like, you can't do this. Like, they're like, you're never going to be able to do this. You're not going to be a good mom. You're not going to succeed. You're like just every type of like self doubt was in my head at the time. Like I'm a baby myself. Like, how do I have a baby? How did this hospital just let me leave with, how did they let a child leave with a child? You know what I mean? Like I was just beside myself. So I think I would go back there. I I remember this vividly. Like I was sitting on the bed in my bedroom and like just sobbing. And like the baby was with my husband and my mom wasn't there yet. And I was just sobbing. I I would go back to that point and I would sit across from her on the bed and I would say, everything is going to be okay. Like you are going to be okay. Like you are going to be a good mom. You are a good mom right now because a good mom, someone that wasn't a good mom wouldn't be feeling these types of feelings right now. Like you are a good mom. You're going to continue to be a good mom. You are going to provide, like you are going to be okay. I love that so much. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. Okay. Okay. I have been throwing the floor at the end of the episode to the guest. Oh. If there's any burning question that you have for me. So now let's pretend this is your podcast. Oh my gosh. You're the host. You get to host this thing. Do you have a question you want to throw my way? Because I've been asking you things this entire time. Mm-hmm. So now the floor is yours. Is there anything you want to throw my way? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, we kind of talked a little bit. Just you said everything that like you hobby wise, you kind of turned into a career. And obviously again, like you done super well for yourself and everything is beautiful here and wonderful. And like, you seem incredibly successful and you are an incredibly engaging person. Um, is there anything else that you see your, like if all of this went away tomorrow, what would you do? Man, I love that question. <laughs> um, if this beautiful space wasn't here, if you didn't have this fancy equipment, if you couldn't create. Okay, if I couldn't create. So like the skill of being able to just like jump into another creation yes, is yes. okay. Because um, I, I tell you right now, I, there's a, no part of my brain like pictures you like in a suit going <laughs> to a nine to five. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I truly do not think I was built for that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a part of me that like, even I, I think even without the creativity, I would still be making somehow. Okay. 
Um, and I think that would probably turn into really leaning into like connecting with people in a way and being a part of a community in some way. Um, you know, if I, if I couldn't just go pick up another creative skill or something like that, and if you want to get really, really specific, I think if I wasn't allowed to be creative, but could still, I was still me, but could still do things genuinely, I think I would become a therapist or a counselor or, or something like that. I could see that. I think that's what absolutely what I would do because that's a thing that like right now I wish I could do, mm-hmm. but I don't want to do the schooling for it. Well, you're kind of doing it though with these podcasts, I feel like. like Which is fair, yeah. This, I don't know how long we've been doing this right now, but like this has felt incredibly therapeutic for me. Yeah, and I think... If I'm being honest, and stuff like this is my cheat code to get to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I because, love that. Uh, you know, it's like I, I get to do it without a piece of paper that says I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's essentially like what what these things are or any conversation I have with anybody. Like I've said a couple times in this, like I love just going and like getting coffee or something with, with mm. someone and making it known that like let's just talk about everything. Yeah. Let's talk about literally anything you want to talk about because I just love doing that so I think yeah if we took away all the creative stuff I still I don't think my brain would work any differently I don't Mm. think I my wants or needs would change I definitely think I would pretty swiftly adapt to like getting a new version of what I want Mm -hmm. and I think that would be probably leaning even more into just human connection yeah because I I think about that a lot sometimes like there's a saying um That I saw somewhere at some point, and it was like, essentially, um, when no one else is around, who are you? Mm -hmm. And I think that that goes for, like, physically, if no one else is around, who are you? And also, like, let's bring the internet into the equation. If the internet didn't exist and social media didn't exist, who are you? Who are you? So if you're taking away that platform of uh, a projection of who you are, and not that everybody uses social media in a fake way. Like, I I don't think everybody does. A Mm -hmm. lot of people can. Sure. Um, but if you take away that like creative outlet, the creative way to showcase yourself, um, and in the same way that when everyone leaves the room, do you, you know, kind of take off the mask and it's like, you know, ah, glad I'm through that conversation. Yeah, glad that's over. Yeah. I can't believe they asked me about their problems. I'm so annoyed, (laughs) you know, whatever. Um, and I, I, I believe that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I do think that I've, I've found myself in a position where just like you've been saying, uh, probably the theme of this podcast, like there's still really bad days. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still super difficult times where I'm like, I, I'll get through it, but like, damn it, I don't want to. Yeah, like, like, I don't want to like, trek through the mud This again. is kicking my butt today. Yeah, exactly. for sure. Like being aware that you are getting your butt kicked, but mm-hmm. still being like, I'll keep going. Yeah. Like, it's all right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's those sort of things that I have fortunately unlocked in myself that I can identify and that I'm aware of, that I, I'm aware I have those tools, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that does make me confident in saying that, like, yeah, like, I know who I am when no one else is around. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, know, I know the things I'll still want to do. So to the original question, if all of that was taken away, all the creative, you know, all the things that I've, like, established right now, if those mm-hmm. went away... I think you're 100% right. Yeah. I'm not tossing on a suit and going to a <laughs> nine-to-five. <laughs> Um, unless I find a way to like own the nine to five. Exactly. <laughs> own your own therapy practice. That's probably the <laughs> way that I would go. But yeah, I think um, I probably answered that in a little bit more detailed than realistically what, what it needed. But um, yeah, I think if, if all the creative stuff went away, I'm still, I'm still finding a way to like... Still making connections I, I'm still people. I'm still connecting with people. Yeah. I'm still building those bridges, 100%. Yeah, I definitely see that. Like, as soon as you said that, I was like, that makes sense. Yeah. I can totally yeah. see it, for I also sure. love that you kind of reaffirmed, like, yeah, this podcast, like, the, sort of a therapy session, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. Like, you know, it, it's... We talk, we've talked about this for however long now. Like, it's hard to talk about this stuff. Like, I, I don't, I don't just sit down and talk about yeah. the last 30 almost nine years of my life and yeah so talking about all this has been very like I feel a little lighter yeah. right now because I, yeah, I'm gonna talk about this I've been therapy but again like that's not like a daily thing where I'm just like sitting down talking about all of my problems um but this this has felt good yeah. this, this felt really good that's honestly like yes we're making a podcast but like 
that feeling is more than anything what I wanted this show to be built off of. Yeah. And, and there has been plenty of people, like, once we're done recording or at the end of the episode or whatever, there have been plenty of people who are like, that felt like a therapy session. Yeah. And that... Just like me being like, hey, I feel like you're my big sister. You telling me that this felt like a therapy <laughs> session, that's the highest compliment that you could give me in the midst of this. And so. same with the big sister compliment. Like, that is 100% the best compliment you could give me, too. So. Incredible. Look at this journey we've been on. Look at this. Look we've at been this. all over the place. At the end of this podcast, we're sitting and we're like, wow, you don't feel half bad. You have a big all. sister. I just had therapy. Like, incredible. I love it. Did you know <laughs> you were going to get a younger sibling who happened to be a secret therapist? You didn't know that was going to I happen. am here for it. You didn't know that that was coming. <laughs> so, Krista, I have one final question for you. Lay it on me. It's the same question that I end every single one of these therapy session episodes with. <laughs> okay. So, right now, I want you to pretend like everyone in the world can hear you speak. So the pressure's on. Mm. But you've got a live mic connected to literally everyone. They can hear you. They can understand you. Throw logic out the window. You get to share something with everyone right now. What is it that you're telling them? And what would you want them to hear? Wow. That's... that's, that's I feel very on the spot. That This is like the most on the spot. <laughs> felt this whole this time. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm going to go back to kind of what I would tell my younger self in that you're okay. We're all okay. Like, yes, life is going to beat us down. Yes. There's going to be shitty days. Yes. Things are going to be hard. Yes. We're going to be in survival mode sometimes, but at the end of the day, like you're going to be okay. Like that self-awareness and that self-care and loving yourself and putting yourself first and investing in yourself and always being open to learning and growing and making mistakes as long as you learn from them. Like, I, I think that that's, that's what is the most important thing about life, honestly. Like, I don't know how really to phrase that super eloquently. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I love it. Krista, this was a blast. This was so much fun. I'm like, I'm so stoked we finally got to make this. I know. Like, this has been is, several months in the works. It really <laughs> has been. And I'm so glad we finally made it happen. See, at the beginning of this, you were like, I don't know how this is going to go. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm very go. interesting. And I would say at least we just had a pretty interesting conversation for about two hours. Was it really two hours? Yep. Oh my goodness. When you said that at the beginning, <laughs> yep. you were like, these probably are going to go like an hour and a half to two hours. I was like, there's no way. Like in my head, I'm like, there's no way we're talking for two hours. I can't and believe we, we just did. And like, again, therapy, like there was no point of that conversation that felt forced. There was no dead air there, except when I just stumbled right there for what I wanted to tell the world. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's, that builds the uh, anticipation yeah, to, the, but, to the big final monologue. But no, this has been perfect. This has been so much fun. Yeah, this is so rad. I Can cannot, we do this again? I, uh, do you want to? Do yeah. You have, do you have, I, are there more stories? That there we might be. I don't know. We could go get out. coffee. We could do that. I don't know. This is so much fun. Listen, here's the thing. Uh, I always try to make sure to tell everyone this that I have on the show we can always have these conversations without recording it. Okay. So if there, if you're ever like, and in fact, I want that to happen with anybody I ever sit down with. If there's ever a time you're like, hey, do you want to go just talk for two hours and go grab coffee or whatever it may be? Know that my answer is already yes. And it's just <laughs> figuring out when. Figuring out when. That is exactly okay. Well, I'm going to hold you to that 100%. I'm in. Okay. I'm already in. We can get it on camera, on audio right now. <laughs> Lock it in. He has agreed. It will happen. Krista, thank you so much. Thank you. We did it. We did it. All right. I am so, so glad that I got to sit down with Krista um, and get to know her in this way. I mean, you heard me say it all in the episode there. She is just wonderful to be around and to work out with and be coached by all of that. Um, and, and this is honestly another reminder for myself, honestly, um, of how valuable and fun 
doing this show is because I just get to sit down with people that I want to know better and we have this little therapy session life story interview thing um, and we become closer and and I love that Um, it's so much fun and like I said I feel like this episode was just a feel-good conversation not crazy or wild or even super dark or anything just like straightforward and and honest about life and everything that we all have to deal with um, that, that not a lot of people get to see Um, So yeah, big thanks to Krista for coming on the show and sharing all that she did and just being open and honest with everything, Um, even though she didn't think that she had an interesting story coming into this at the start. Um, I do need to plug our gym real quick before we end the episode here. It's a lovely place. I go to it all the time. So does Krista. Of course, we love it. You heard us mention it in the episode. Uh, So check out CrossFit Gahanna. Follow us at CrossFit Gahanna OH. Uh, Fun fact, their Instagram also recently got hacked, just like my personal one did. Um, And I've been helping them rebuild theirs along with my own. So go check it out and follow it if you're interested. Of course, though, if you're really interested in checking the gym out, just just come to the gym itself. Let me or Krista know that you want to try it out. And uh, I know that both of us would be so, so stoked to help you get in there and give it a shot. Um, It's honestly a blast and truthfully not as scary as you probably think it is. Um, Okay, so let's wrap it up. You can follow this show at WYDHpod. You can officially follow me personally again on Instagram. I made a new one. The rebuild process begins. I am now at Ross Tyson. No more who's just at Ross Tyson. So Toss a follow if you do feel inclined to keep up with all that I'm doing. Subscribe on whatever platform you checked this show out on as well. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Same with Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you really liked what you heard, leave me a review. Toss some stars and a written review on whatever platform you're on. It seriously helps out a ton. And a final reminder to check out our sponsors from this week and support them if you want. If you're a creative in the world of video, audio, or photo, then go check out Midwest Photo here in Columbus. They've got tons of services from gear rental, gear purchase, used gear, buy and sell, print services, film development, and a simply very knowledgeable staff that is ready to help you with your photo needs at any time. So go check them out or visit npex.com for more information. And if you're looking for some concerts to go to, well, Promo West Production has you covered. They're bringing a lot of those your way here in Columbus. Visit promowestlive.com to find all the information you need or to find out what other shows are uh, coming through town and then go snag your tickets at axs.com. But that's it, 76 episodes and three years of this show in the books. So thanks for listening. If you watch this on my YouTube channel, thanks for looking. And as always, I'll be back next episode with a brand new guest that you may or may not know of and a brand new story that, well, you for sure never heard.